Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 to 15. Good morning, family. This is the third week in our series of Jesus or Moses, Jesus, and the space in between. And uh, as it's customary for us at the Meeting House, every summer we spend a little bit of time in the Old Testament looking at a story as well as getting to hear some, uh, some of the voices that are in our community. Now, by, the, by doing this, uh, we get to do something that we know as a staff team and as a pastoral team, that we are filled with all kinds of incredible voices and gifted pastors. And uh, this morning, I'm, I'm privileged to have my brother from another mother here with us, uh, Mr. Chris Chase, who's uh, our pastor from Newmarket, who'll be sharing with us this morning. This is a great opportunity. I'm, I'm excited to hear what you have for us, brother. There you go. Okay, sounds good. And uh, <laughs> just uh, help me welcome uh, our brother Chris this morning. We appreciate you very much. Much love to you. Yeah, man. Same and we look forward to it. We'll see you. Favor ain't fair. He's the, one of the most handsome men I've ever met in my life. It's just not fair. Take that compliment, my guy. Take it. All right, boom. Check it. When I was uh, 12 years old, growing up in Montreal, Quebec, God's country, God's hockey team, all that sort of stuff. Oh, we already have enemies? Fine. Sounds good. In Montreal, at the age of 12 years old, in grade 7, I started high school. It's crazy, not because I was a genius or anything, just in Montreal, in Quebec, we start high school in grade seven. So I remember being 12 years old, taking the city bus for the first time, going to school in a big space for the first time. It's one thing when you're the tallest kid in grade six. It's a whole different thing when you walk into high school and your, your mustache hasn't grown in yet, and your voice is still squeaky, all that sort of stuff. And you walk in, it's this big new world. And you know, it's like you have to find a group of people to survive to feel at home. And I, I remember, I 
kind of got caught in the wrong crowd. I found myself just with the wrong set of people and I, had to, I made some decisions that I'm not really proud of. Decisions that are still affecting my life to this day. Because the crowd I, I hung out with was the drama club. <laughs> That's what you guys were all thinking, right? When I started telling that, right? Acting, ladies and gentlemen, acting. I would spend all of my time with the drama club. I spent five years learning improv, writing scripts, and learning stage hands up. That was the bulk of my, my life. And the greatest thing about being a part of the drama club was the idea of being able to take on different identities. Carmen spoke a little bit about that last week. The idea of being able to take on different identities was so much fun for all of us as high school students because if you weren't the coolest kid in school, for a couple of moments, you could pretend like you were. If you weren't rich in your family for a couple of moments, you could pretend like you were the richest person on earth. If you weren't cool, you, you get where, where, I'm, where I'm going. This idea of identity, you can put on a jacket and be, pretend to be somebody else and then take it off and, and go back to your existence. Moses' story, as we know, is, is filled with identity. In fact, if you're writing a script on Moses' life, you could describe it as double identity. This idea of having to live in two worlds. And so I want to walk back through a little bit of Exodus chapter 2 before we get into Exodus chapter 3 to do a little bit of a recap on this double identity story. So we first start in uh, Exodus chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 and we have this origin story of, of Moses. You know it well if, you're, if, you're, if you've read it before. Moses is born. He is kept alive in secret for three months because there is a decree that all Hebrew boys should be killed. And his mother, she keeps him alive. She builds a basket and she pushes him down the Nile River. That's, that's, I'm guessing she pushed, her back, pushed him that way. And then while he's going down the river, he is found by Pharaoh, who would be the, the king, if you will, in some respects, of, of Egypt. He's found by his daughter, she opens up this basket. She finds this child in, in the basket. And even though she knows that he is a Hebrew boy and that this child should be killed, Scripture says that she takes pity on this child and she decides to keep this child. And then along the side of the water, Moses' sister has been watching this basket go down the river and she just kind of pipes up and she says, hey, listen, would you like me to find somebody to help you raise this child? And Pharaoh's daughter says, yes. And somehow... By way of providence, Moses' mother, who's undercover, again, like it says, a script, undercover as a, a, a help nurse, gets to raise her own son and teach him his Hebrew heritage. That's the origin story. And then you have the crisis. You move down to verses 11 to, tw to 21 in the story. Moses, he's grown up with his Hebrew mom for a short time, and then he's then given over to his adoptive Egyptian mother, and he's fully aware of his dual identity in the midst of this single citizenship. And as he's growing up, one day he goes outside and he sees an Egyptian man beating and harassing a Hebrew slave. And he is somebody who feels this, this, this need to move into action and he kills this Egyptian. And long story short, Pharaoh finds out that he's done this and puts out a de de decree to kill Moses. And Moses, who's only known Egypt, Moses, who has this dual citizenship, Moses, who is an adoptive prince, has to go on the run. He runs to a town of Midian. Wherever the hero, he always likes to jump into stuff, he sees a group of women being harassed while they are trying to take care and give water to their flock. And he goes and he saves them and they see him and they describe him as an Egyptian. They don't know whether it's because of his accent or because of his clothing. He's of two people. He then marries one of these women, Sephora, and he has a son by the name of Gershom, whose name means a stranger there. Or broken down even more so as, as Moses names his son, he says these words, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Moses is in a dark wilderness. He has good things around him. He has a family, he has a job, he has a house, but he still feels out of place. He still has to run and hide. He's still afraid. He's still mixing multiple ideas of who he is and who he's trying to be, what he's trying to find. He's trying to find, to quote the song, 
his place in this world. Shouts to any of you who are fans of Michael W. Smith. Maybe you can relate to the feeling that Moses is describing. You have that sense that you have it all together, but you're still sort of wandering or meandering through life. You are walking in the dark while trying to find the light switch. Maybe your life is not as dramatic as Moses. Maybe you're not on the run for murder, but you can still, you're still in the season of how long, man? How long do I go through this? How do I get out of this? For some of us, whether we're in this room or we're watching in a theater or watching on YouTube on a, mid, on a random Tuesday, whatever it is, you're, you're, you're able to, you've been experiencing maybe one hurdle after another. Health issues, relational struggles, employment, mental health, overwhelming uh, doubt, or maybe, like Moses, things are good. Like Moses, you have a job, you have a family, you have friends, you have stuff that is good for you, good in you, but you still feel like, I don't know where I fit. You're still trying to figure out this idea of God's purpose for your life because you know that it's not being lived out to its fullness. And you're asking this question, where is God in the midst of all of this? Where is God in the midst of the wilderness? Well, we just read, shout outs to voiceover Dan, we just read through Exodus chapter three, verses one to 15, but let's set the scene once more. So one day, like many of his days, Moses, he goes out to care for his father-in-law's herd. He's far, it's a far cry from being an adoptive uh, royal. He's in the southern end of the peninsula of Sinai. It's a mixture of peaks and valleys. And while he, he's there, he, he looks out into the distance and he sees a bush on fire. He, it doesn't make any sense. It's a desert ground. And if you know anything about the desert, you don't want to be around a fire. It's really quick to catch and cause more destruction. But here, it's just a bush, flames flickering, and the sound of the wind and grazing sheep. And this peculiar sight, it moves Moses into investigation mode. Moses, he's ever the hero. He has to jump right in with both feet. And what he finds and he learns, it changes his life. It changes his purpose. It changes the history of the people of Israel. And it gives us today, 2022, thoughts and lessons on who God is in the midst of our wilderness. So we're going to take the next 15 minutes because there's just not enough time. We're going to take the next 15 minutes to walk through where God is in the midst of the wilderness. What do we learn about him in the midst of our wilderness? First thing we learn is this. He knows who we are. In the midst of the wilderness, he knows who we are. He knows our name when we feel forgotten. God recenters Moses. He says his name twice. I was... I was an active child. And so my parents always had to say my name twice because I knew if they said it once, it wasn't that serious. I can get away with it. But if I heard Christopher, Christopher twice, especially Christopher, oh, I was randomly just kind of cleaning the dirt under my name. I was taking care of stuff because it meant something was really important. Moses, he, God says Moses' name twice. He adds emphasis He's really trying to get his attention because there's something special when someone special calls us. It says you're being seen. It says, come and be here. Moses, Moses, his name means being pulled out of the water. And as God says his name, he's literally saying, Moses, Moses, you who have been pulled out from your home, you've been pulled out of everything that you know, you who have been pulled away from the life that you have lived. I know who you are. I know why you run and hide. You who have been wandering in this weird existence, I know you. And what he says to us in the midst of our wilderness is he knows who you are. He also knows our struggles when we feel unheard. Not only did God know Moses, he also knew the pain of his people and he cared for them. Exodus chapter two, verses 23 to 25 says this, 
During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned and in their slavery and cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned with them. God is literally saying here, I see the pain of my people. I have heard their prayers and I'm here to move. It's this beautiful thing where God is telling Moses, even when I was silent, I knew and know your struggle. I was there. Your struggle and your pain, it's not foreign to me. I hear the cries of your heart and I plan to act on your behalf. Friends, this morning, even if it seems like God is silent, God is still moving. Sorry, I'll say that again. Even if it feels like God is silent, he's still with you and he's still moving. It's okay if you say amen to that, friends. It's okay to agree with that, to know that he stands and he walks alongside us. So he knows who we are. And then secondly, he promises to walk with us through the wilderness. Not only does he know us, he plans to walk with us. We see that God commissions Moses with the leading of leading the people of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses' response is, you talking to me? You got, you got the wrong guy. I'm not, I'm not the one. That's not for me. And it makes sense after all that Moses has gone through, that in his life, his trust and his confidence was at an all time low. And God responds to him with these words in verse 12. I will be with you. Moses says, I, I don't fit. And God doesn't respond by saying, yeah, you do. God doesn't respond by talking about Moses' accolades and what he's, been, he's done before. God responds by simply saying, I will be with you. God's presence is enough. I will accompany you on this journey. Wherever you are, I will be with you too, not just for a moment, but continually. He responds to Moses' doubt in himself with his promised presence. One, one commentary says this, if formerly his self-confidence had been such to take the whole matter into his own hands, his self-confidence now went the, the length of utmost reluctance to act, even only as the Lord's messenger and minister. The remembrance of his former inward and outward failure was no longer applicable for God himself would be with him. No longer did Moses have to rely on his own heroic instincts or feel limited by his dual identity and doubt. Now he could lean on God fully and be led by him. And when Moses, because Moses needs to you know, firm it up and make sure and cross every T and dot every I, asks for a confirmation of who is sending him, in case he gets asked about it, God doubles down with it in verse 14. Haya, Asir, Haya. I am who I am. I am has sent me to you. The one who is with you. The I am is a, is a play on the word of Yahweh as it's written. He's basically saying the one who has called you the one who made you, the one who pulled you out, the one who gave his attention to you, the one who's called you by your name, I will be with you. You don't walk alone in this. When they ask you who sent you, you can stand on my name. No longer do you have to be the hero, Moses. No longer do you have to pretend and feel like you have the whole world on your shoulders, like you need to be the one who saves everyone. Instead, lean on me. When you're not, lean on me. I mean, it was right there, guys. It was right there. Lean on me. I am who I am. When they ask you who sent you, tell them Yahweh did. Tell them I did. And tell that to every generation following. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing what we're doing right now. That's why we sing songs. That's why we talk together. To remind ourselves that God is with 
us in the midst of the worst of our lives, the difficulties, the meanderings, the wilderness. He is there with us. Not only am I God, I am the God who is with you. Heaven here below, heaven here with us, God with us, not abstract all the way over there where we can't, right here in us, with us, leading us. God is basically saying to Moses, no longer would he walk in the dark alone. No longer would he have to run and hide for the God of the universe would lead him, would speak through him, and eventually, as we, we heard, bring him back to the exact same mountain, the exact same spot, completely different than that moment. Wouldn't it be beautiful that we would walk back into situations that we're in right now, a year later, two years later, completely different than how it was when we first got there because of the the goodness and the presence and the power and the life-changing moments of God. Wouldn't it be beautiful to know that we don't have to walk through the wilderness alone, but we walk with him. And as we walk with him, he changes us and he brings us right back to spaces where we were before. And we can say, oh God, I remember what you did. I remember, I remember where I was, I remember what you did, and I remember that you've been with me the entire time. Who would have thought that it would be in the midst of walking in the wilderness that God would not only meet us there, but lead us through it, making us better for it, wiser for it, and deeper in devotion to him. Friends, the wilderness is painful. Can we admit that? The wilderness is painful. It is not picturesque. It is not Instagram or TikTok worthy. I've just made my daughter embarrassed by saying TikTok as an adult. That's all right. Even though the wilderness is painful, it is where God can shape us into who he wants us to be, to bring us back to that space much more like him. And that promise of I am is available to us today. Friends, that promise, the promised presence of God is available to us today. I invite the worship team to, to come back. Throughout the scriptures, throughout the highs and lows of humanity, God's promise stood it was made real through the life of Jesus, who he himself went through his own journey in the wilderness. So there could be a photo on, on the screen at some point. And we, we know that Jesus, he takes time into the wilderness and out of that, he is better for it. He is commissioned into ministry and he goes and he preaches and teaches and lives and changes the world. But a part of that was walking through the pain of being in the wilderness. And like Moses and other men and women through scripture and like our savior Jesus, we have the opportunity as we walk through the painful parts of life, we have the opportunity to learn a bit more about who God is, to learn a bit more about what he wants to do in our lives so we can become better. And in those moments where we feel completely alone, completely abandoned because we don't hear the voice of God or we don't sense his goodness because how long, bro? Still? I've been walking in this forever. Where is he? Can we be honest for a couple of seconds that we try to be nice and you make me brave, Jesus? We have moments where we're like, where are you? I don't know why we're, <laughs> so we're clapping, but sure, okay, things like that. We, we, we have these moments where, where we still know what's going on. God promises to be with us. Friends, he promises to be with us. 
He shows himself to be faithful throughout scripture. And Jesus, as he's talking with his disciples, as he's getting ready to commission them into ministry, he's getting ready to, to push them out into the water, if you will, to put them in the basket and say, it's up to you now, guys. He commissions them. He gives them tasks to do. And he tells them this in Matthew 28, verse 20. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And that promise was for them. And that promise is for you and I. That promise was for them. That promise is for you and I. And I don't know what you're going through, but there's more than one of us in the room, which means that there's probably a couple of problems here, there, and everywhere. I don't know what you're carrying. I don't know if there's a, a litany, a list of things. I don't know if it's kind of like, I'm just walking through life, and I, I just don't know where I fit. I don't know if there's, there's things that are public, things that are private. I don't know. I know my own stuff, and if you ask my wife Rebecca, she'd say, and there's more stuff than that, Chris. I don't know. But here's what I do know. God is with us. Hello. God is with us. We do not walk in darkness alone. We do not walk in the wilderness alone. We do not walk in fear alone. We do not walk in trepidation alone. We don't walk walking through the dark trying to find the light switch. He is the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. He is with us. And so may it be for you this morning, may it be for us as a church, may it be for those who are kind of here or watching and kind of investigating because they clicked on a YouTube link, they clicked on a YouTube link that went from watching Kinder Eggs being open to being part of our church. I don't know. YouTube is weird. I don't know how they got here, but maybe for all of us that we hear that and hold on to that in the midst of confusion, in the midst of the I don't knows, in the midst of the how long, bro, we don't walk alone. Even if it's silent, God is with us. Can we pray together? Lord Jesus, we thank you that as you promised to Moses, as you promised all the way through, through scripture, as you claim for yourself, you are with us. And I pray for my friends today, I pray for myself as we all have our current wilderness experiences. God, I pray that we would be reminded deep within the core of our being, even in your silence, you are with us. May we hold on to you. May we hold on to that truth. And may we walk with a little bit more confidence, knowing that you will bring us back to this space stronger, wiser, and more devoted to you. And we thank you. We don't like the wilderness, God, but we thank you for it because you meet us there. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen.